Hello everyone and welcome to the History Hotline. This is going to be a very special episode because I'm joined by a very special guest today. We are thinking about the theme of migration and different types of people that came from different parts of the world to this country that we call Britain, some of the challenges they might have dealt with, how they formed communities um, and how they essentially navigated British society in their respective eras. And so our guest today is the wonderful Satya Gunput, and Satya is a British Mauritian PhD candidate um, in the field of history, of course, at Birkbeck um, College in part of the University of London, and his PhD is funded by the Bonnard Trust. Now, his work focuses on the history of immigration and ethnicity in post-war Britain and how that kind of interacted with government on a national and local level. It also looks at political debates surrounding multiculturalism, which I think is a key theme of his work and also creates um, this kind of idea and looks at the idea of empire, um, afterlife of empire in modern British history. And so Satya received his master's in historical research from Birkbeck College in 2016 after completing his bachelor's in modern history at Christchurch University of Oxford. And his broader research interests look at post-colonialism, transnationalism, and then kind of intersections between race, class, and gender. So all the things we talk about on this podcast on a regular episode, which is why he's a perfect guest. Um, so today we're going to be thinking about, you know, the some of the kind of South Asian um, migration and the diaspora of South Asian people, um, Black feminist groups in Britain, Um, And this is exactly what Satya's work looks at. He looks at mental health among Afro-Caribbean migrants in Britain. And he has written on the lived experiences of a kind of wide range of different people of colour in this country. Um, Also a keen fencer, a fantastic (laughs) fencer. um, And, you know, at an international level, which I just thought was so interesting um, when I was reading your bio. Um, So welcome, Satya, to the History Hotline. (laughs) Thank you very much for a comprehensive introduction. I think that's the best introduction I've ever had. So, oh, I'm honoured. <laughs> I'm honoured to have you, and I'm honoured that my introductions are are living up to it. So, oh, we've got a lot of questions, I think, and a lot to talk about because, well, we're honoured to have such a knowledgeable guest. You know, they're normally stuck with me, um, but we've got you today. So, I thought we'd start with like some quick fire questions, um, just to get to know you as a researcher, as a historian. And as a person, um, so don't you know? Don't panic. They're not going to be too <laughs> intrusive. I hope, um, but they are quick, so don't think about it too long. Is that okay? okay? I'll be quick. Wonderful. What is your favorite historical book or text? Uh, I don't know if it counts as strictly historical, but I really like "Policing the Crisis" by Stuart Hall at Al, the, the Birmingham Contemporary Culture Group. Uh, Love that. Yeah, that's yeah. one of my favorite. I don't know if it's strictly historical, but. It's yeah. historical for me now, so. <laughs> Definitely. Makes sense. I love that. Um, and then your favourite historical figure? Uh, I, I once sat next to Gail Lewis at a Birkbeck Ooh. function, and wow. I didn't clock it was her until uh, quite into the conversation. And then yeah. I thought, this is the first time I've sat next to a bona fide historical figure, someone I write yeah. about in my thesis. So I put wow. Gail. Defo. I like and she's an one. Arsenal fan as well. So Ooh. double points. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, gosh. Okay. Okay. I'll give you that one minus the Arsenal you know, little, little point there. Um, and then a bit of a strange question, but why do you like history? Um, I've, I've had a really good history teacher at school. Um, wow. And from like a, a like in primary school really got into me like the storytelling aspect of it yeah. and as as I got into like academically into history obviously maybe a, the storytelling aspect becomes less important but yeah. especially when you write on histories of race and ethnicity and people of color yeah. actually a lot of that work is about like sometimes recovering stories which aren't told, which are out there, but maybe not recognized formally in, in some parts of like historical work. Definitely. So then that's like offered me an opportunity to return to that way of working, I guess. That makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. And I think importantly, um, we speak a lot about education here on this podcast. And you said you had a really great history teacher. And I think 
a lot of people unfortunately have had the complete opposite and you know they're not involved in history today and they kind of pick it up later in life because it's kind of a necessity to kind of maybe understand your roots or your your family's history or where you came from but this good history teacher that you had we're very thankful for because now we have work you know coming out of scholars like yourself um which we need in society today I think definitely um so who kind of who or what maybe not sure motivates you um maybe it's that teacher since you've just said that but to study history like what keeps you going in the field um what keeps me going I think if you've if you've had to do like a big research project ever and when you go to an archive or have to do an interview yeah. and sometimes you find something or someone who you think was doing something amazing or yeah. like changes what you think about a period and those sort of like mini Euro- eureka moments they're yeah, like definitely. it's it's like a little like adrenaline rush and I think sometimes feeling like you're doing something useful uh, yeah. because a lot of time in history you, you think oh well what's the point I, it's, it's not a stem subject or so, uh, that's, that's what people sometimes say of course. but I guess um yeah th- those moments make you think like you're doing something really invaluable and I guess in the last few months there's so much attention on what the curriculum what a history curriculum should be in schools Absolutely. Uh, and like the importance that activists and uh, have think of and like normal citizens, normal school kids think about w- wanting to like dictate what their what they their curriculum have a say yeah. in what they want to know. Yeah. I think that, that those seeing that on like a, a national scale, almost every day on the news or on discussion programs on the radio, yeah. that that's given me like a little motivation to think, oh, it's worthwhile carrying on in this field. Definitely, it has been. I think at the forefront of so many conversations, especially following. Black Lives Matter, but then now with, you know, the statues being returned to the, um, to Nigeria and so many different parts of history are coming to the forefront of like national conversation, which is wonderful, I guess, for us. Um, it kind of puts us, <laughs> gives us a job to do. And mm-hmm. yeah, as you said, makes us feel quite worthwhile, definitely. Um, and if you could research any historical time period or area outside of what you do and your expertise, what would you do? Where would you go? What country or time oh. or... Um, so, oh, I, I would go to I, uh, Mauritius, Mauritian history in like in the colonial period between yeah. the French and the British handover, um, because during that period, um, I think the, it, it's just a really confusing period of Mauritian history. Yeah. And there are questions about slavery, indenture, and crossovers and, and living together, communities that it's, I think there are lots of people working on it. It's not yeah. under-researched, but we'd, I would love to know more about it. I think it, it tell it, especially, you know, my interest is about like the afterlife of empire. Yeah. And those, I think this is a part of empire I would I would love to research more fully if I had the resources to go stay yeah, in Mauritius definitely. and do it from there but <laughs> yeah and you'd be in Mauritius in the sun yeah. <laughs> exactly in the cold oh that would be fantastic yeah definitely I don't think we think too much about um the kind of crossover periods of, of different European colonizers taking over and switching and a lot of countries especially in the Caribbean as well had that switch over mm. you know Jamaica went from the Spanish to the British um after a war and so on and so forth so yeah definitely I've never even thought about that as a field to kind of get into but yeah definitely if you have the chance you should do that (laughs) for sure (laughs) and my final question in this little segment if you weren't studying history at PhD level you weren't doing all of this what would you be doing so I'm not allowed to say teaching history at school or anything like that no history Uh, it doesn't exist no history (laughs) uh probably I'd be doing something really boring then uh, oh, no. I thought you'd say fencing. I'll, yeah, okay, fine. I'll say fencing professionally. <laughs> I'll say that. You don't have to. <laughs> no, I'll say, no, no, that's true. I sort of feel like I do that already, though. So I feel that's also cheating. But I'll say fence. Yeah, fencing is the okay. thing. Coaching Fair fencing enough, at the very least. Then. I think by your hesitancy to answer, we know that you would be doing something historical. You have to be. Yeah. If you weren't this, it would be a history teacher. So <laughs> yeah, we, we get, we understand the passion, it's, I think, definitely. It's like uh, when whenever a footballer gets asked, uh, what would you be if you weren't a footballer and basically like a PE teacher? I just did the yeah. equivalent of that. So 
I'm going to think about your research and you're going to teach us and teach me because as much as I know, you know, many little things around uh, immigration, empire, Windrush mainly, um, I think your research is something, it's like a blind spot for me. It's like, you know, um, some of the things you think about and you look at in depth will come up in the periphery of my own research or my own reading, but I never kind of get to delve into them. So I am really excited to to kind of hear you know about your research so I guess thinking about migration um you look at obviously um South Asian communities um if you want to just talk us through kind of where your research in regards to migration kind of started and or where it is now um in regards to this kind of idea of like migration and empire so um my entry point in my PhD and also in my master's was to talk about Southall which is a part of West London which at the time was most known for being home to a large Punjabi community. So from Punjab region of India, which is an area that was really affected by partition. And I suppose the first thing to say, if we're talking about like empire and how it impacts migration is the people who come over from Punjab to Southall, there is sort of an urban myth that that accompanies their their migration, which is that there was a factory in West London which oh, yeah. uh, someone had served alongside Punjabi soldiers in the in, in the war. Yeah. And the urban myth in Southall, which actually has quite a lot of truth to it, was he was so impressed by the valor and strength of Punjabi soldiers that when he was in charge of a factory in West London, he, he got some people to come over and then sort of chain migration people encouraging people from Punjab uh, to come over. And yeah. I, I entered that as that, that sort of, that little uh, sort of historical reasoning and started to think about um, what sort of the legacy of a Second World War, what it meant to be in sort of the imperial forces of Britain yeah. and why in the 60s and 70s, uh, teenagers are justifying their presence in Southall in Britain by saying, well, it's because Sikhs fought in the Second World War. We were Absolutely. part of the British Empire. And even through the 70s, uh, there's evidence of people who came to Southall when they're eight years old, and they still justify their presence by saying, "Oh, my great grandfather fought for the British." Yeah. And I, I was thinking about that as sort of like an imperial connection. That, w- mm. like, I'm sure you feel it with with Wind- Windrush. Is sometimes the popular narrative is it's almost like that moment of first contact where a bunch of people in Britain meet these strange, dark, these dark strangers. And yeah. everything changes. It's a, it's like, uh, it's like ET. Sort of, they meet for the first time. <laughs> um, Definitely. Yeah, and and I, actually, I was trying to find this tale about uh, Punjabi men predominantly yeah. serving and then coming over yeah. uh, to Britain. And then, as, as the case, as as I'm sure in your research as well, that the Immigration Act start changing, and yeah. they start in, incentivizing people to rush over in 1961 before they, they there's a sort of a, an assumed ban coming in for immigration of course. yeah so suddenly the the makeup of this migrant co- uh, community completely changes yeah um you have women dependents children and sort of the the i i don't want to say stresses but the requirements mm. of uh of the, the local authority the state yeah. for that population changes so we have really controversial things like busing in Southall yeah. where uh, and I, it happened in Birmingham as well yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, where uh, South in Southall it was South Asian but also some Caribbean kids who were bused to schools nearly 10 miles away some as far as Watford yeah. to um, from West London and to uh, to effectively be taught separately from 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 white british children because parents didn't want them taught in the same classes yeah. um and then and then i i suppose i i talk about migration by starting from like a really fixed geographical point south yeah. and i i understand that there are lots of people that perhaps think about diasporas more broadly so mm. the punjabi diaspora in in britain or yeah. punjabi diaspora globally and my approach in my work has been to say, uh, let's pick a part of London and work backwards from there right. and figure out what are the currents bringing people here uh, to to Southall. And I guess one one point I, I would probably raise is that myth, of, well, that story 
about uh, Punjabi soldiers serving alongside the British and then following a, a captain who was working in Southall to, yeah. to this factory in, in West London. It seems half true because there was someone who had served in, in, in British India uh, and he ha- did initially start recruiting Punjabi men. Yeah. But there were so many other reasons that they may have ended up there. Uh, mm. one, the main one probably is partition, that the Punjab is a really uh, volatile region. And yeah. there's a huge amount of, I think it's the, maybe the biggest mass migration in history when India and Pakistan get partitioned and people rush across the border, people sort of, of deracinated from where they grew up, from their land. So once, once you're removed from your from where you grew up, from your homeland in maybe one side of the border... To yeah. suddenly move to another country maybe has less of a it's it's less scary it's less daunting. Yeah, and definitely. I think when you start from Southall and you try and work backwards along that sort of that that path of migration, uh, you uh, empire is really important. It's almost impossible to understand that without thinking about those the end of empire, but also the imperial experience. So, for example, yeah. the war, and I I, I guess that. Maybe one big thing I thought of, especially when we've gone through Brexit and all these quite like fraught confrontations recently, mm. is one <laughs> accusation that has sort of been thrown back at people is that it's like imperial nostalgia. But yeah. Brexit is a manifestation of imperial nostalgia and people can't get over empire. And that might be true, but I think it's worth saying that it's not only the sort of Brexiteers who frame their lives via empire or sort of yeah. imperial amnesia but for I, this, I hope it doesn't sound too controversial but like for <laughs> Punjabi migrants in Southall like yep. it's really hard to understand why you're in Southall if you're in the 70s without saying without explaining it with with reference to the empire it frames your life in in Britain yep. and even like your possibilities and how you're treated by the police, by the state, by your health care outcomes, yeah. your education, everything. And it's understood in those terms. Um, yeah. Definitely. No, you have, yeah, definitely brought up a lot of things to think about. But just pulling up on your kind of point of this, you mentioned end of empire. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting way of phrasing it. I I don't know if you're, would you say empire end ended, I guess, um, in a sense, of you know now that we have this migration to Southall specifically let's think about that um how do yeah how do you feel it being framed as an end of empire and how why do you frame it I guess as as end and ending of empire um I think on on one level it is it is like the ending of formal empire so the the structures that we recognize politically of one country having sort of jurisdiction or ruling over another, those come to an end because they're yeah. no longer uh, practical, morally acceptable or economic if, yeah. after the Second World War for any number of reasons. Um, and I, I think that, I, I, I think I, I get what you're, you're getting at, that <laughs> we today I could go into newspapers and read about their needs to decolonize something or other as yeah. if empire still hasn't ended or some aspects of it ha- haven't ended. And um, I, I guess that it's a, historically it's important to, to mark a different period. Definitely. But there, there, is, there is something, while these imperial connections are historic, they go back over 100 years, um, this is like a new phase of yeah. the relationship. And it's, a, it's something new in Britain that... The period that both I think both you and I concentrate on, a uh, visible difference really matters yeah, in Britain. Definitely. In, in a way that would seem extremely strange to us now. Uh, um, but those sort of interactions, yeah. they are important and they are new. And I think I, maybe end of empire is strange because if you ask someone to pick a fixed date, when did empire end? Uh, it, yeah. it's a fool's errand that you're not going to be able to do that but I think we can talk about a, an extended period of time maybe yeah. from the end of the second world war to I guess 1968 1971 that period where Britain is slowly getting rid of its of its of its empire yeah. and, and I guess the thing uh, I think 
we could even think and comparatively a bit. So the end of empire in France is a really dramatic event. Like the Algerian war nearly brings, well, the Algerian war ends a government in France. It creates a huge yeah. domestic crisis. Absolutely. Uh, Britain doesn't necessarily have a, de- a defined moment like that. And I think the sort of uh, stereotypical response, it, it ended with a whimper, not a bang. Yes. Um, <laughs> that, that, that can, I don't know if it's right to say there's truth in that, but at least that's the, that's the way it's popularly portrayed. But yeah, this was sl- really silently phased out. And then there was a sudden new demographic change in Britain. Yeah. Um, but I, no, I, I understand that uh, at some point, like the empire is not, it's not one thing. It, it, it it's, it's quite, it's fluid. And I think, especially with the populations, like the people of color, the yeah. sorts of groups I study, um, a lot of it is about reaching back to that heritage and trying to reshape it to your advantage, whether it's yes, as an absolutely. activist or whether it's to demand change. But it's yeah, not necessarily yeah. to be trapped into it as something that never, never goes away. Definitely. No, that makes sense, Defo. I just wondered, you know, what your kind of definition of that was, um, because it is, an, I think, a very interesting term and can be unpacked quite a lot for sure. Um, thinking about South Hall, Ben, um, and this region in, you know, uh, West London and I guess in a way I think you frame it quite interestingly because as you said you start from South Hall and you track that backwards whereas I think for me when I look at um, especially Windrush I kind of look at the Caribbean and then I work forwards to you know whether that be Handsworth or Brixton or some other part of the United Kingdom um, so should we talk about South Hall um, what was the situation what was happening in South Hall sound like you're a reporter and so over to you. What was happening in South Hall in the 1970s and 80s? Um, that kind of, I guess, what was the reason for, you know, the South Hall Black Sisters? Why did they have to form? And, you know, why why was it the case that this was needed in South Hall at this moment? So I, I think the starting point for that is to say that South Hall is a really radical black space in the 1970s. And yeah. I, I know that you, you've done previous podcasts about sort of political blackness. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 and this is the period when that term black is has a really expansive definition. And in this historical moment, it it means a lot for many groups, especially uh, groups, sort of younger a- adults, uh, sort of adolescents. They reach across to this idea of being made black in Britain, being black in Britain. And this is a description of your life I- in Britain in relation to empire, racism, capitalism as well. And um, I guess the South or Black Sisters are a, a radical Black feminist group. Yes. They are a Black feminist collective as they describe themselves in this period. And they are, I would go so far to say, as they are only possible in a place like South or, where a, a majority South Asian community is able to describe themselves as Black and say and understand themselves in those terms and what leads to that sort of realization is, is sort of quite it's like a confluence of factors so you have the the men who initially come to work in south hall they are put in the worst jobs i, I think one guy describes it as they're put in all the smelly jobs so they're in yeah. factories they're working yeah. insane shift patterns they're they're rep- ramifications for their health in the sort of heavy industry they're working with Definitely. Then when you start having sort of a populated demographics changing, uh, busing is another instance of sort of unequal treatment in South Hall, depending on the color yeah. of your skin. Uh, and that's not just for the children. It's also a sense of unfairness for the parents. Definitely. The police uh, uh, start being, I guess, there's quite like vigorous, quite nasty policing in South Hall that creates a lot of, racist policing there are there are instances between the police and citizens uh, and residents of south hall which are violent they're aggressive and they're racist uh, yeah. and this is a this is something that the reports i use come from the runnymede trust uh yeah. from uh i think one of the reports written by deepak nandi who is uh, a marxist academic whose daughter yeah. is now the shadow foreign secretary uh, lisa nandi wow. um so those um those can those sort of experience in South will start rolling together and there's perhaps one moment 
but galvanizes it. And there's uh, on one, in 1976, uh, yeah. there's a murder by National Front, uh, well, a gang of National Front members, thugs, yeah. whatever, who murder Gurdip Singh Chaga, who is an 18 year old student in Southall. Yeah. And over the next few days, a lot of the sort of community representation who yeah. in, invariably tend to be Punjabi men of a certain age who have sort of are repackaging politics from India, so trade union politics into community wow. representation. Yeah. And young people in Southall don't want these people to speak on their behalf. They don't okay. accept, you know, we want calm on behalf of the community. We need good race relations. It's sort of yeah. a tipping point. And from that moment, you get organizations like the Southall Youth Movement, who is, who is again, it's it describes itself as being the Southall Youth Movement, not the Asian Youth Movement, for example, okay. because they're trying to reach across to uh, Afro-Caribbeans who live in Southall as well. Yeah. Um, probably the most famous is Misty and Roots, the reggae band. They make yeah. a song mm-hmm. about the Southall riots uh, uh, and they are connected with the Southall Youth Movement at this time. Yeah, and the symbol of the Southall Youth Movement is a clenched black fist. Uh, so they're reaching across to uh, to the symbols of black power. Yeah, they're yeah. reaching across to uh, ideas about black activism in the UK. Yeah, and they are thinking about that poli- like those politics. So the Southall Youth Movement have reading groups where they read Franz Fanon, who wrote The Wretched of the Earth, yep. which is a really yep. radical text about empire and uh, colonialism for. definitely um and why the south or black sisters emerge from this moment is the south or youth movement is quite a macho organization it views yeah. anti-racism as street fights with a national mm. front so yeah. these guys would travel in the 70s to other other neighborhoods nearby and go and find some national front <laughs> thugs and try and get into a fist fight or probably worse and yeah. um this is this is like a recurring theme in in that period of Southall, but right? it's a really macho expression of anti racism. Okay. And then you hit nineteen seventy nine, uh, and they have you have a Southall riots. Yep. And just like as a sort of a tangent, uh, is that the Southall riots are when I, I've been reading the work of Paul Gilroy and Stuart Hall, and from 1981 to 1984, you have St. Paul's, Brixton, Handsworth. Um, you have uh, Moss Side as well. You have lots of riots in urban Britain. Um, but it's really easy to forget Southall. And in fact, I was reading Stuart Hall's reflections on the McPherson inquiry. And he doesn't mention Southall in that, that sort of that, that time frame. Uh, and you know there 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 perhaps reasons it could be a simple oversight. He might think it's not important, but I think sometimes to think of South Asians as being like a, a radical black collective in this period, it, it's it's I think it's being lost uh, as Def- sort of I would historically, agree. yeah, yeah, uh, no, it's, it's definitely, really yeah. But no, I I think it's a really important point to pull up because. I think I when I hear that list of kind of those early 80s riots, Southall isn't in them. You know, it's mm. it's Moss Side, it's Brixton, it's Hansworth, it's Toxic, it's yeah, um, it's Tottenham. And I think it's very easy to kind of push out the South Asian experience mm. because it doesn't necessarily cleanly fit into this Windrush narrative that we have mm. so neatly packaged up, I think, um, in some parts of society. And I definitely think um, it needs to be brought back because yeah. you can't separate out Asian people out of the struggle, um, the anti-racist struggle in Britain in those yeah. early days. It's just in regards to women as well. We had OAD, you know, yeah. um, the organisation of women for of people of African and Asian descent. Yes. You know, that was a culminative movement and it, it didn't just start as the mix. It was just for African descent. And then we had women from in, coming from Kenya and Uganda, Asian yeah. women who said, well, we're coming from Africa. Um, you know, where's the movement and the space for us? And I guess you have Southall Black Sisters as well. Um, and thinking about what they ended up then fighting against with anti-racism, but then also stuff like domestic violence within, mm. you know, their own communities um, and re- religious fundamentalism and other things in that sense, I think to kind of X them off of the narrative of blackness because we've moved on from political blackness or we don't use that anymore. We don't use terms like, well, BAME. You know, we've got, we've got people of colour. We've got these... <laughs> 
amalgamations of, of non-white people. And I guess as black people, we don't want to feel othered mm. um, in British society, which I think is constantly done. But by doing this kind of separation, we, we forget about the, the South Asian stories and it's like cutting out, you know, an arm from a body yeah. um, of anti-racism because it is definitely a part of yeah. it. So thank no, you for I agree. That one up. Yeah, I, and I think just just quickly, it's like, you like Indo Caribbeans, like Roy yeah. Swa, like an Indo Guyanese guy who is right. like really important for the British Black Panthers. Uh, you have um, when Malcolm X comes to Smethwick, he's invited by the, the Indian Workers Association. I think it's Doshi is this the yep. guy's name. Yep. Yeah. Him and his wife uh, in, invites invite Malcolm X to Britain mm. to Smethwick. And so Birmingham is a very Asian area to this yeah. day, and Smethwick especially. So. Yeah. yeah, you can't separate them out <laughs> at all. Yeah, and so this exactly like your point is one of the reasons I think South Hall is important for British history. And uh, actually, yeah. that's the point of my PhD. If it wasn't important, I wouldn't be able to do it. But <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's like, yes, yeah, South Hall. It's it makes us maybe reassess what we think about race and ethnicity, and how, in, in my opinion, in, in my research, what comes up is the what race is or what it can be as a political tool, mm-hmm. I think something like the South or Black Sisters, they are a group that that look at race and say, how do we bend the edges of this to our advantage so we yeah. can make a political platform which has the biggest chance of achieving our aims, which is in yeah. the case of South or Black Sisters, to improve the lives and opportunities for women of color living in Britain. Right? Like, yeah. it's, pretty, it's pretty clear. And actually, some of their campaigns still be on Britain as well. Um, uh, I guess for the South or Black Sisters, like just to to think about them, like when you start talking about Owad, so the South or Black Sisters, they go to speak to Stella Dadzi, they they are in, in interaction with these groups, they take notes, and they have all their memo, all their memos are stored at the Black Cultural Archives in Brixton, and they're having these conversations about how are we going to represent South Asian and Afro Caribbean women? Can we do this? And um, I guess at the time, they view the decision to represent both Africa, both African, Caribbean, and South Asian women as a political decision. So, not something that is perhaps based in the, like in, like the practical daily business of running a yeah. woman's refuge, but something that would be important politically. Absolutely. But this is a comment on how the forces they see oppressing mm-hmm. women of color in Britain. Yeah. So that is state racism police racism it's also patriarchal forces in their community okay. often religion because they are a secular organization um immigration laws mm-hmm. uh i think the, the list goes on and also capitalism it has to be yeah. said that they they are a socialist or they they have people who are socialist in their group and they they use this analysis to think about the ways that women of color are sort of at the bottom of the heap sometimes Definitely. um and I guess perhaps the most famous is we could spend all day talking about their various campaigns <laughs> <laughs> and we do have a time limit, but their most famous campaign, which was actually turned into a movie yeah. with uh, an Indian actress called Ishwaya Rai. Okay. It was called Provoked and it was about the case of Kiranjit Aluwalia, yes. who was a... <laughs> It was a South Asian woman who killed her husband in self-defense yes. uh, after he had uh, abused her physically, yeah. was violent towards her. And she was initially jailed for, I, I think it was murder or, or yeah. something along those lines. And the South or Black Sisters launched this huge campaign. I think mm-hmm. they even they got Princess Diana involved as well uh, to, <laughs> to, to free her. And yeah. they eventually ended up, it ended up with. Now you might be thinking what happened in the case of Kiranjit Alawalia and you might be thinking why has this episode come to an end? Well, I'm sorry to say we are having a two part episode this week because when I came to edit this podcast, I realised there was just so much information in each part of this episode and so many facts. You know, we've talked about the Punjab, the end of empire, South Hall, different ways to fight anti-racism, fights with the National Front and the kind of masculine front of this anti-racist work. 
the Southall riots, the Southall Black Sisters, OAD, and the case of Kirinji Alawalia. And so I didn't want to overload any single episode. And I think Satya has given us so much food for thought in terms of this one episode in thinking of, you know, South Asians um, and what that means in regards to anti-racism in Britain. And so we will be back next week with part two, where we will be thinking more about South Hall as a region, anti-racist struggles in the context of black women, Asian women um, and people from, you know, different continents that were all fighting essentially the same fight against the British state and also overt racism in this country. And so, yeah, thank you so much to Satya, who has been a fantastic guest. We've learned so much and we, you know, we'll be seeing him again next week. So please do tune in, follow us on our social medias and on our podcast platforms and have a wonderful week. Goodbye.